<laughs> Good afternoon and welcome everyone um, to our annual homecoming back to class faculty presentation. Uh, I am Allison Campbell, UCR Foundation Stewardship Committee Chair. And our presentation, Climate and Consequences, What Research Predicts, is sponsored by UC Riverside's uh, Chancellor's Associates Program, the university's leadership annual giving society. So to all those members of the Chancellor's Associates joining us today, thank you all so much for what you do to support UCR. Uh, so now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's event, uh, Iqbal Pitawala, who is the Senior Public Information Officer in University Communications at UCR. So take it away, Iqbal. Thank you, Allison, for that. And thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Well, before I introduce our faculty for the presentation, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items for this event. You as the audience can see us, but we cannot see you and you cannot see each other. If you have questions, please submit them for the Q&A by clicking on the Q&A button on your Zoom screen. Questions will be answered as time permits at the end of the presentation. Climate change, the defining issue of our time, is already having dire consequences on our planet. Temperatures are expected to continue to rise. Precipitation patterns are shifting in ways that can threaten food production. Sea levels are rising that can threaten coastal areas with flooding. Many regions of the world are seeing more droughts and heat waves. Wildfires are becoming more common and uncontrollable. And hurricanes in the North Atlantic are turning more intense and frequent. Well, fortunately, we have three scientists at UCR who are joining us today and they will show us how the impacts of climate change are both global and regional in scope and how we could adapt to these impacts. First, we will have Professor Robert Allen. He received his doctoral degree in atmosphere, ocean and climate dynamics from Yale University. And he's a professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at UCR. His research utilizes climate models as well as a wide range of observations to improve our understanding of the climate system. This includes natural variability and the processes involved, as well as how climate is changing, what is driving that change, and how to adapt to and mitigate such changes. His talk will be followed by that of Dr. Lynn Sweet. She is a research scientist at UCR Center for Conservation Biology. She received a doctoral degree in plant biology from UCR. Her projects focus on applied plant ecology in desert communities in Southern California. Her study spans small to large scale plant physiology to biogeography and considered questions about vulnerability and persistence in plant communities. Her current projects include a long-term study focusing on the conservation of Joshua trees in an era of drought and climate change. Her talk will be followed by that of Professor Miri Oskan of the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at UCR. Dr. Oskan is a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors, a Frontier Fellow of the National Academy of Engineering, and a Keck Fellow of the National Academy of Sciences. She's also the Climate Action Champion and change maker professor of the University of California. She completed her graduate studies at Stanford University and at UC San Diego. She made breakthroughs in sustainable electrode materials, advanced battery technologies, green chemistry for material processing, and battery manufacturing with game-changing ideas of using waste glass and plastic bottles. And now to begin our presentations, we will hear first from Dr. Allen. Hello, everybody. Uh, so I'm Professor Robert Allen in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences, and I'll be talking about uh, global climate change, air pollution, um, and the main tool that I use in my research, um, climate models. So uh, start a little bit broad here. Uh, climate change is happening and it's accelerating. 
the panel on the uh, on the left hand side is showing you um, the global decades of warming, um, and you can see that. Uh, uh, the, the amount of warming is, is accelerating as we go through uh, the decades of the 20th century. And in fact, uh, the last decade, the 2010s, um, is the warmest decade on, on record. Um, since 1880, there's been about uh, a little bit more than one degree Celsius or two degrees Fahrenheit of total uh, global warming. Uh, the panel on the right hand side is showing you the 10 hottest years on record globally. Um, so what this uh, panel on the right is showing you, it's, it's, it's basically saying that the the last, uh, uh, the, the 10 warmest years um, on record have all occurred since 2005. Um, and the six warmest years on record have all occurred in the last six years. Um, 2019, uh, the last complete year uh, is the second warmest year on record. Um, 2020 um, is on pace to be in the, in the top three. Um, so all of this is driven by uh, an increase in anthropogenic CO2. Uh, which is the main cause of climate change. Um, and main sources of anthropogenic CO2 are the combustion of fossil fuels, including coal, um, natural gas, and oil, um, as well as deforestation. Uh, so global climate models, or GCMs, um, are basically a three-dimensional mathematical model that solves the equations of, of motion, energy, uh, water, as well as others. Um, the panel in the upper right is showing you um, how, how, how we use GCMs. Basically, we break up the planet into these grid, grid cells or grid boxes, um, both in terms of latitude and longitude, but also um, in terms of um, elevation for the atmosphere and depth for the ocean. And in each of these uh, small little grid boxes, uh, we simulate all the physical processes that are important to the climate system. Um, some notable ones are, are, are the uh, radiative transfer, so the, uh, the passage of solar radiation through our atmosphere, the emission of thermal uh, infrared radiation by our planet back to space, um, the circulation of, of both the atmosphere and the ocean, uh, the fluxes of, of, of heat uh, between the surface and the atmosphere, including latent and sensible heat. Um, and we also represent uh, hydrological processes such as clouds and rainfall and snow. Now processes that occur on uh, spatial scales that are smaller than the grid cell size um, have to be parameterized. Uh, and what this means is, is that we approximate um, by a very, by, by simplified process, but one that's still based on fundamental, fundamental physical principles. And um, examples of, of parameterized processes are, are clouds. Um, there are about 50 different GCMs used by um, researchers worldwide, um, including the IPCC. Um, so the IPCC stands for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and it's the leading body for the assessment of climate change. Um, these models are very large um, and they are computationally expensive. Um, so in order to use them, you need to run them on supercomputers. And the panel on the, on the very bottom is showing you an example of a supercomputer. This is the NASA Pleiades supercomputer, um, which I have uh, run some of my simulations on. Uh, when it came out 10 years ago, it was about the third fastest uh, supercomputer in the world. Um, now it's only about the 30th uh, fastest supercomputer in the world. Uh, but it's composed of about 250,000 uh, processors. So there's been significant advancement um, in GCMs over the last several decades, um, both in terms of their uh, spatial resolution, um, but also in terms of their model components and processes. Uh, so the panel on the right is showing you the increase in spatial resolution through time. Uh, so far, the first assessment report uh, occurred in 1990. And you can see uh, most of the GCMs in 1990 had a, had a grid resolution of about 500 kilometers. Um, if we um, follow the, the panels downward um, to AR4, the fourth assessment report by the IPCC, uh, which was in 2007, um, we can see that the, um, the GCMs have a spatial resolution of about 110 kilometers. Um, so um, spatial resolution is improved um, and also the components and the processes. So the panel on the left um, is illustrating that. Uh, so the first GCMs in the 1970s um, were very simple, um, basically an atmosphere model um, with very simplified external forcings, including CO2 and, and, and solar variations. Um, but as we progress through the decade, um, additional model components have been added, included, uh, including a land surface, uh, ice, um, clouds. Um, eventually, um, we, we get an ocean, including um, ocean circulation. Um, we have additional external forcings such as sulfates and volcanic activity. Um, 
uh, and as we progress, we have atmospheric chemistry and interactive veg vegetation. Um, I apologize, my slides are advancing without me pushing the button, but we'll proceed. Um, so why are GCMs useful? Um, well, basically, they're, they're tools um, to better inform decision making. Um, they offer an improved understanding of the climate system, um, and they also provide future predictions. Um, we use them for de detection and attribution, which is basically, basically ascribing an observed climate change signal due to human activity, um, natural variations, or a combination of both. Um, so the two panels on the left are illustrating how we use GCMs as a tool, and more specifically, detection and attribution. Um, so the panel on the upper, upper left, the black line is showing, the, showing you the observed evolution of global surface temperature anomalies. And the yellow lines are all the model simulations. And the thick red line is the average over all the model simulations. Um, so you can see that the models do a good job at reproducing the observed warming over the 20th century. Um, the panel on the bottom is analogous, okay? Um, but here the blue lines are showing you the same models, but instead of being forced with greenhouse gases and, and aerosols, um, the models on the bottom are only forced with solar variations and, and volcanic activity. Um, and you can see that the models um, are not able to reproduce the observed warming since 1960. Um, so what this says is that the warming um, over the last several decades, um, since at least 1960, cannot be explained by solar variations and vol volcanic activity alone. And in fact, um, the greenhouse gases are most important. Um, so much of my research is kind of at the intersection of, of, of climate change and, and air pollution. Um, so atmospheric aerosols are airborne submicron particles. Um, the panel in the upper, upper uh, left is showing you an, an, an example of what these aerosols look like. Um, so the, the black circular blobs are an example of sulfate aerosols, um, which come from the combustion of coal or oil. And then those little arrows are pointing to what's in panel B in the upper right. Um, so this is a chain of, of, of what we call black carbon or soot. Um, black carbon or soot comes from industrial processes as well as diesel and biofuel combustion. Um, so aerosols are the cause of, one of the main causes of air pollution, um, otherwise known as particulate matter less than 2.5 microns. And like climate change, um, air pollution is another very important environmental issue. Um, nine out of 10 people worldwide breathe polluted air. Um, and it's also an issue in California. California has eight of the 10 most polluted cities in the United States. Um, in addition to affecting um, air quality, um, aerosols also impact the climate system. Um, they have a net cooling effect on the climate system, um, but some aerosol species actually warm the climate system, such as the aforementioned black carbon or soot. So how does climate change impact air pollution? Um, the panel on the upper left is showing you a model result. It's based on about 15 different models um, from the latest um, IPCC assessment. And it's showing you the change in air pollution as quantified by particulate matter. Um, and it's under, a, it's under a high greenhouse gas emission scenario. Um, so all the reds are showing you an increase um, in, in air pollution. Um, the panel on the right is showing you how robust those results are. So where you can see the dark red in the right-hand panel, that's indicating that uh, nine out of 10 models agree that um, continued emission of greenhouse gases will yield an increase in air pollution. Um, if we normalize by the total uh, amount of warming in these simulations, what this means for the United States is about a 7% um, uh, PM 2.5 increase per degree of warming. Um, so the bottom line here is that the global warming will exacerbate poor air quality. Um, so why is that? Um, well, again, this is an example of, of how GCMs are useful. Uh, we can use them as a tool to understand processes and mechanisms. So it turns out that under high greenhouse gas emissions, warming results in uh, this enhanced land warming. So the, the continents warm more than the oceans do, um, and in turn, the land dries out. And the panel on the upper left is showing you that. So this is uh, the change in temperature under a high greenhouse gas emission scenario. So warming occurs everywhere, uh, but you can see the continents are warming more than the ocean. Now I've designed some simulations um, that effectively mute the enhanced land warming. They're nudged simulations. So the bottom left panel is illustrating how I've mute this enhanced land warming. So you can see that the ocean is warming similarly to that in, in the top panel, 
um, but the continents have much less warming. And in fact, the amount of warming over the continents is very similar to that over the ocean. Now, the panel on the right is showing you the corresponding change in air pollution as quantified by one aerosol species, secondary organic aerosol, and it's broken down by season. Um, the black line is showing you the increase in air pollution under the default uh, warming scenario. And then as you go from the black to the red, to the purple, to the green, um, progressively muting this enhanced land warming. So by weakening the warming contrast, this increase in anthropogenic aerosol also weakens. So air the air pollution increase under continued warming is in part due to an increase in continental aridity. Um, how about future climate projections? Um, now, the panels in the, the upper two panels are showing you um, the evolution based on two future emission scenarios. Um, I'm showing you sulfur dioxide in the upper left, which is the main gaseous precursor to sulfate aerosol. And on the right is methane, which is another, besides CO2, it's another very important greenhouse gas. And it's broken down by two different future emission scenarios. The red is showing you a weak air quality control um, scenario, and the yellow is showing you a strong air quality control scenario. So for example, by 2100, under the strong air quality control scenario, um, sulfur dioxide emissions have decreased by about 70%. Um, so what is this impact, how does this impact uh, air quality as well as um, global warming? Um, well, the bottom right-hand panel is showing you the change in air pollution as quantified by PM2.5. And if we compare the red line um, with the blue line, um, you can see that the, the, the blue line has a, has a decrease in PM2.5, okay? And the blue line is, uh, is it's, it's the strong air quality control scenario where we effectively reduce um, aerosols and ozone precursors only. So it's about a 15% reduction uh, in PM2.5. Um, but if you look at the bottom left panel, the change in temperature, and you compare the blue and the red line, um, you can see that by cleaning up the air, by removing, uh, reducing the aerosols and the ozone precursors, we actually have more global warming. Uh, and in fact, it's about 0.25 K of warming by the end of the century. Um, so what we can do is we can also try to decrease the methane. Okay, so the yellow line um, is showing you the result um, when, we, when we decrease both the aerosols and ozone precursors as well as methane. So we get a similar improvement in air quality, right, the bottom right-hand panel. Um, and the bottom left panel is showing you that um, we, we basically um, have cooling um, relative to the weak air quality control signal by the end of the century. So we've eff effectively um, offset that enhanced uh, warming um, when we reduce the aerosols and ozone only. So improving air quality causes additional climate change and it's necessary to simultaneously reduce the greenhouse gases, um, including methane. Uh, what about closer to home, California um, hydrology um, and, and, and focused on California wintertime precipitation projections? So models project an increase in California wintertime precipitation under continued greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the panel is showing you um, that change um, under total. Um, so I've broken things down into three different model subsets. And this is, again, it's based on the latest IPCC climate models. There's about 30 of them. Um, the blue is showing you all, all the models, and the green are showing you the models that better reproduce the observed relationship between El Nino and California precipitation. And the red models are those models that don't do such a good job at reproducing that relationship. Um, so um, the models that better simulate this, uh, this, this observed teleconnection um, yield a larger wetening trend um, for California during the wintertime. Um, this panel is also showing you that the increase in mean wintertime precipitation, the total, um, is entirely driven by an increase in extreme precipitation, precipitation that exceeds the 90th percentile. Um, so this, this, uh, this increase in precipitation is consistent with enhanced moisture. Uh, a warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture, um, so you would expect an increase in rainfall. Um, Non-winter seasons are projected to have um, less precipitation. And this panel here is showing you California drought projections under, um, um, under a high greenhouse gas emission scenario. Um, so we're looking at the enhanced uh, springtime California drought risk um, at the end of this century relative to the beginning of this century. And I've broke it, broken it down into five different metrics of drought. Um, so um, 
meteorological drought, precipitation minus evaporation, as well as precipitation. Uh, stream flow is another indicator of drought. Um, and then uh, agricultural drought, which is a uh, soil moisture. SMT is the top layer soil moisture and SMB is a deeper soil moisture uh, um, drought metric. Um, so this is showing you an increase in drought um, for all five metrics in, under a warmer world um, during the spring. Um, the, the other uh, uh, non-winter seasons are similar. Um, so the models project a robust increase in drought. Um, the increase in drought is larger in the low R models. It's a little bit weaker in the high R models. Um, but the bottom, the bottom line is that there's an increase in drought. Um, so to summarize the California precipitation projections, um, models indicate an intensification of the wet, dry seasonal cycle. So more precipitation during the winter months and less precipitation during the non-winter months, um, but also an increase in extreme events. Uh, and this includes both uh, drought and uh, um, heavy precipitation, which drives flooding. Um, so just to uh, wrap things up here, final thoughts. Um, our ultimate goal uh, should, be, should be to uh, cap climate change, global warming, at no more than two degrees above the pre-industrial baseline. Um, this is consistent with uh, the guidelines of the Paris Agreement. Um, I've already noted that we're uh, over halfway there, uh, more than one degree um, K of warming since 1880. And this is going to require transformative and aggressive reductions in carbon emissions, uh, CO2 in particular, um, particularly by the largest emitters. Uh, so China is, is the number one emitter of carbon and the US is, is the second largest. And in order to keep um, the Paris Agreement, keep, to keep warming below two degrees K, um, we have to have zero net carbon emissions shortly after um, halfway through the century. Um, thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Allen, for that talk. Uh, before we move on to the presentation by Dr. Sweet, I thought I would ask a very quick question. How much faith should we have in these GCMs and, you know, how well have they performed where climate predictions are concerned? You know, some better than others? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Um, we, we, we should have um, reasonable confidence in these GCMs in terms of their project projections. And this is because, um, as I said in the talk, um, they're based on fundamental, fundamental physical principles. Um, they are routinely um, evaluated and they're rigorously tested um, by many different research centers worldwide, um, including the IPCC. Um, and more importantly, um, they've been shown um, to reproduce um, past climate change. Uh, for example, um, they, are, they, they provide accurate hindcasts of the uh, warming that has occurred since uh, 1880. Great, thank you so much. And of course, we'll have time for more uh, Q&A later. Uh, I'll take this opportunity now to reintroduce Dr. Lynn Sweet. She is a UCR alum and a plant ecologist at the Center for Conservation Biology. Thank you, Iqbal. Uh, thank you all for being here. Share my screen. Okay. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit today about uh, a Joshua tree, excuse me, uh, my research on Joshua trees, pardon me, I skipped a slide. Um, so talking about the present and future for California's beloved Joshua trees. So this is research we've done at UCR in the Center for Conservation Biology and in partnership with the National Park Service at Joshua Tree National Park. So before I begin, I wanted to acknowledge that the lands I'm going to talk about and the lands on which we conducted these research um, uh, belong to the, uh, originally to the native tribes. Um, so we acknowledge that the land on which we conducted the research is the ancestral home and unceded territory of the Serrano, Chemuevi, uh, Kuya, and Mojave tribes, and today indig indigenous people continue to protect and remain in relationship with their relatives. Um, it's vital to honor these beginnings and recognize the ongoing dedication and importance of indigenous culture within our communities and within the land that we uh, gather, live, learn, and work on. So thank you. Looking at um, the United States and thinking about biodiversity. So we heard a little bit about, of course, uh, climate models and uh, projections and temperature. Now we're going to go into, into biology. Uh, so thinking about areas of the country that support more and, and less biodiversity or numbers of species. If we look at California over on the left, of course, 
we are a biodiversity hotspot. So we are one of uh, five Mediterranean type climate zones in the world um, and one of 36 global biodiversity hotspots. We have an especially dense um, amount of species uh, within our state. We have only over seven, uh, excuse me, 6,500 plant species. Over 1,500 are, are endemic. So this is just a really rich area. Uh, one reason for that is because of our topography. So we have a lot of topography, mountains, and deserts. And that um, topography also isolates us from, from the rest of the US. So we have really unique species evolve in our area. So we have a really special place in California in which to study biodiversity, <clears throat> excuse me, and the effects of climate change. So when we look at uh, Southwestern Desert Parks, um, we're looking at an arid region and particularly in Joshua Tree National Park, it's already experienced some of the sharpest declines in precipitation in the contiguous US. So this is a really, a really important change in the, in the climate that these animals and plants are experiencing. And these increased levels of aridity and hotter temperatures uh, really haven't been seen for like at least 1,300 years. And um, we've done this research in conjunction with Dr. Patrick Gonzalez, who is the uh, chief uh, climate change scientist for the National Park Service. So he's putting together reports on climate change for each of the parks, and he's integrated our research into, into his studies as well. So it's a really fantastic partnership. So looking at Joshua Tree National Park in particular, um, so we're thinking about uh, climate change, what impacts it might, might have, um, and what we want to focus on um, are areas where species actually occur now that can continue to support species into the future. So I'll explain. So let's say a species has a distribution about like this sort of red blob over the landscape. Um, that's the upper limit of the elevation of the species. And let's say we, um, we want to look at the direction and magnitude of change of where the species might occur at end of century. We'll put it on a map and see where they might occur. And let's say it's something like this yellow polygon. The thing is, the yellow polygon requires for the species to actually disperse into that polygon. So it's easy for things like foxes and deer and so forth. But plants are sessile organisms, and they don't move particularly easily. And I'll talk about the challenges for the Joshua tree. So what we wanted to look into are what are refugia for the trees? What's that overlap of uh, red and yellow here? of orange um, that allows the species to persist in the landscape. Often these are places that have decreased climate change exposure um, and that allows the species to persist. So this is a long-term collaborative project started by Dr. Cameron Barrows and Josh Hoynes at the Joshua Tree National Park. Um, it's an it's a all-encompassing project. We look at actually lizards, we look at uh, plants and animals, and it was really designed to look at how will species of animals and plants react to climate change across transition zone in Joshua Tree National Park. What's really interesting about studying plants and animals here is that there's a gradient. We actually have the low desert off to the lower right, the Colorado desert, hot, very hot, very dry, and we transition really quickly in, up in elevation to the Mojave Desert, uh, which is you know, a little bit cooler and wetter, still a desert, of course. And so we're studying, we have, we have plot, a plot network across the park, and so we're looking at any indications um, that and there are shifts happening uh, with animals and plants across these uh, macro plots. And of course, the park has really interesting gradients or changes in, in resources from you know, winter, more winter rain to the west, more summer rain to the east, mean annual temperature increases towards Arizona. So we've got a lot of different sort of slides on which species might, might slide back and forth as climate changes and as they're forced maybe to move to one place or another. So it's a really interesting um, place to, to uh, do research. I want to acknowledge the funding sources for this project originally were the Earthwatch Institute, uh, some funding from Mojave Desert Land Trust and um, our California Ecosystems Study Unit, which is a great collaboration with, with federal agencies from the University of California. So, so why are, excuse me, why are uh, Joshua trees vulnerable biologically? Um, this is just one of the species we study, but it is, you know, an iconic species. It is the namesake for the park. I mean, it's also quite vulnerable. Um, so the growth is very slow and conservative. Most desert plants have very slow growth because they only get rain in one season and they actually have to uh, spread those resources out over the whole year. So they're very conservative in growth, at least the perennial plants. Rep reproduction has been shown to be episodic and rare for these species. Um, they can reproduce by seed. They, they flower and fruit, of course. Um, but they can also um, sprout from their stumps. But that doesn't help them disperse now, does it? So they actually can't, can't really move to another location by stump sprouting. So we're requiring reproduction in order to shift with climate change. 
They also have one specific symbiotic pollinator species. So only one moth pollinates the Joshua tree, so you can't get Joshua tree seeds without that moth. So that's a really tight relationship that will, of course, be important uh, to monitor with climate change. And they have a lack of broad scale dispersers. So they actually have, um, they don't have the ability to disperse into uh, far flung habitats. Um, they are mainly dispersed by rodents at this point. So very, very short distance dispersal. And I'll talk about why that's a challenge as the habitat is vastly flat. So what's, why, is, why are Joshua trees important anyway? I mentioned being an iconic species and the namesake of the park, but you know, it's really actually important structurally to the ecosystem as well. So it supports that, so that one pollinator of the species, the fruits consumed by rodents, numerous species of you know, insects live in and among it. Um, it's habitat for the yucca night lizard and also for other, other lizard species. And, you know, nesting, perching, hunting. It's one of the largest structural uh, plants on the landscape in the Mojave. So, of course, it's an important structural component of habitat for so many species. Foliage is, of course, consumed by deer and deer and jackrabbits, excuse me. And uh, it's shelter and shade for many animals. Okay, so we're looking at uh, Joshua trees in particular and thinking about um, what might happen in the future. So there have been coarse scale predictions um, of uh, potential shifts in habitat. Um, those need to be tested and refined. And as we look at what's actually happening on the ground, uh, we can look at, um, um, excuse me, it's important to note that any changes we might see with climate change probably will be evidenced by not only things dying, that's what we think about with climate change, you know, large mortality events, but also the first signs might actually be where recruitment or the new generation of Joshua trees is growing. And so we have to, we have to look at that because to get that recruitment to happen, of course we need, we need the tree to set flower, to set, to be pollinated, to set seed, and actually for that seed to successfully germinate and grow. So it's a lot of steps that actually have to occur to sustain the population. So how are Joshua tree populations weathering the changes that are already happening? Is what we want to know. And also, our goal is to work with park managers and say, you know, how should uh, they actually prioritize management for the Joshua tree habits, habitats given what we find out uh, by studying them. So part of the effort that we, we put in is a uh, species distribution model. So um, we take essentially layers of environmental variables, much like Dr. Allen mentioned, temperature, precipitation, um, climatic water deficit, which is sort of a measure of how dry things get. So we take those layers and we take GPS points of Joshua trees, landscape, and we use that to project where suitable habitat would be on the landscape, kind of like a window of where Joshua trees would be now, and then looking at in the future. So taking those layers for future, uh, future times and actually projecting future habitat. So that's what we did for Joshua trees. And so we wanted to look at not only that, but we know that there's a range of scenarios of what, what might occur with climate change. This is a graphic that came out of the Inland Des Desert Summary Report that was an effort at UC Riverside to uh, characterize um, really tightly uh, climate change impacts on communities. So looking at this graph running from 1960 to 2100, you could look at the temperature change there, average maximum temperature. And for a highly mitigated scenario, so we do really, we really get together, do something about climate change, limit it, as Dr. Allen uh, mentioned. Um, that would be high, highly mitigated. Moderately mitigated would be a little bit more so. And business as usual would mean we are, as, as you mentioned, continuing to um, burn fossil fuels and produce carbon dioxide at the same rate. So business as usual actually means the sort of the worst we're talking about here. And we wanted to see what, what are the differences and what might happen to Joshua trees if you look at these three scenarios. So this is the uh, modeled uh, distribution of, of uh, Joshua trees within Joshua Tree National Park. Uh, historic to current, Riverside is of course off to the west here. This is the I-10 running through the Coachella Valley, Palm Springs. This is uh, Joshua Tree um, up, up on the north end. And so we had, um, we had 14 plots spread across the park um, that are shown on the map. Um, and then the gray area shows the current to, historic to current suitable habitat for Joshua trees. So uh, covering a large portion of the, of the park. We look at the highly mitigated scenario. Uh, this would be, we really take action on climate change. We really do something about climate change. 19% left. Then we look at what might happen if we really, um, we do a little bit less. We, mo we moderately mitigate our, our climate change uh, impacts. 14% of historic range might be conserved. 
then we look at business as usual. We're talking almost zero of suitable habitat. This is the end of century. We projected to be suitable still for Joshua trees in Joshua Tree National Park. So that's, that's striking. Um, we modeled not only in Joshua Tree, but a little bit to the north. Uh, it's important to note that there is some Joshua Tree habitat that does run north in here. But thinking about the Joshua Tree National Park, again, our, our partners, let's validate this model. Let's say if all models are a little bit wrong. Let's see if this makes any sense. So we actually measured recruitment and uh, Joshua Tree distribution throughout the park uh, with ecotourism, local volunteers, and various learning groups. Uh, how are they doing? Well, we looked at high recruiting plots, which means plots that are um, producing young trees at a, at a higher rate, and then low recruiting macro plots, and the X's here that are not producing trees at a very fast pace. And actually, we, we found that um, uh, using the uh, highly mitigated scenario, most plots that are not recruiting are located outside our model refugia. So those we're already seeing a shift in where young Joshua trees are occurring. So. So this is, uh, you know, this is troubling. So we are, we're already seeing that we probably want to really protect that area of what we call refugia. Um, and meanwhile, Mojave de Desert ecosystems are not well adapted to fire. Less than 10% of trees survive wildfire. Um, the modeled area of refugia might be used to plan fire management. So that's one way we can actually use this information, plan uh, what to do on the ground surrounding these Joshua tree stands that are very important to conserve. And of course, I wanted to point out the, um, the uh, utility of seed banks actually for habitat restoration because without a disperser, without something to disperse trees into new areas, we really value those seed banks and, and uh, folks that are planning what might, what might we do with climate change. All right, so how might Joshua trees survive? Um, we've got essentially they'll move into upper topography, upper habitat, um, and then human actions. Wildfire prevention, we want to prevent the wildfire landscape action on climate change, which is uh, the gist of what we found, um, and reduction in air pollution as well, because that pollution actually feeds invasive plants along the, uh, the soil surface that actually promotes wildfire. So we want to do that as well. That's another action we can take. So in conclusion, uh, forecasting the climate-related shifts is really important for conservation. Um, we have to validate those predictions with field data. That's really important to see if we're really catching what's going on. Um, the suitable habitat might really be wiped out by end of century under that business of usual scenario. So that's, that's troubling. I mean, it's important to, to just remember when we're talking about this, especially with our families and friends, that climate change is going to have really local significant impacts on our personal lives and the places we love. And this is one example. So this is a place a lot of people love. And this is an example of what might happen if we don't, don't do anything on climate change. So in conclusion, so the future might be troubling for Joshua trees. We've already seen changes in where the new trees are occurring and things are likely to get worse, but the degree of which that happens really depends on human action. So I find so thank you. I'd like to acknowledge my co, uh, co PI Cameron Barrows at UCR. Thank you for that, Dr. Sweet. That was awesome. Uh, I had a quick question for you. Um, you know, your talk uh, focused on the Southwest, but I imagine there's some other lessons we can take from that. You know, what are some other areas of the country we should pay close attention to for similar effects of climate change? Yeah, so when we wanna think about which areas might be vulnerable, we'll think about which species are particularly vulnerable, which don't, you know, produce seeds, produce uh, new young very well. And then we'll also, so we're thinking about sensitivity to climate change. And then we're also thinking about areas that depend on a certain climate for structuring the ecosystem, such as coastal areas. Those require a tidal zone in a certain space. Glaciers that require, you know, have, have had that snowpack uh, for a long time in one place. And then we want to think about um, places that have very restricted habitat. So, for instance, Dr. Gonzalez's research uh, looked at pikas in Lassen National Park. So those, that habitat's restricted to mountaintops. As climate change happens, that habitat will disappear. So really restricted range and sensitive species. Thank you. And of course, we'll have uh, time in the end for Q&A from the audience. Uh, I'll take this opportunity now to reintroduce Dr. Miri Oskan. She is a professor of electrical and, com electrical and computer engineering at UCR. Thank you very much. And I'll try to share my screen here. Uh, 
It says that room Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, but uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, because I keep getting these notifications from the Zoom saying that something is unexpected and it's quitting or something. All right. So today, uh, actually, I will be uh, talking about uh, taking responsibility for a sustainable future. And uh, my, I lost all the modes here, so let's see if I can. Uh, yeah, probably I can't do it, but I don't know what's going on, but my screen is flickering. So uh, I hope everybody can see me and hear well. All right, so um, what uh, I, hmm. Things are not playing well, so I don't know. Uh, all right. I would like to start with the, uh, the challenge that we are facing forward. And uh, maybe this way is better for the seating. My computer kind of like wants to reboot also at the same time. Um, the worst population, uh, as you can see from the plot, is that uh, it's, it's from 1800 to 2000, it's almost uh, increased about six folds. Uh, so that brings a number of good questions to ask. For example, first of all, is the, will there be enough food you know, to support all the people? And the projection is about 9.2 billion by 2050. And will there be enough natural resources to support the energy demand of this uh, large population? And will there be any habitable atmosphere to sustain the life because of you know all we are experiencing in increased emissions of the greenhouse gases other questions to follow this uh, how can one support the well-being of uh, the people on the planet and also the planet itself in areas where both intersects and this question follows in a way that can one sustainably you know, supply food, water, and energy to the people, and at the same time, you know, curb the climate change, design a future without pollution and waste. So here, what personally I took responsibility on are reducing the waste, you know, such as you know, plastic and glass, and try to convert them uh, into uh, a high grade valuable materials that can be utilized in, in uh, making lithium ion batteries to power electrical uh, vehicles. So uh, as you know, electrical vehicles is one way to do drive green and with zero emission. So I try to see if I can use any waste such as plastic or glass to make these batteries to power the zero emission cars. And uh, another uh, angle that I also try to approach is environmental cleaning. And this is uh, to do with the ocean oil spills, with the oil tankers, whether we can clean and collect the oil in a way that we don't emit any carbon dioxide. First, we need to look at uh, the carbon emission by sector. So what you see in the plot on the right here is that the so global carbon dioxide emission, you know, division by sector. And as you can see, the transportation is anywhere between 
20 to 30 percent, depending on the source of the data that you collect from. So about 20 to 30 percent is coming from the transportation. It means that if we try to make the driving or transportation green, then we can maybe mitigate the carbon dioxide emission. Excuse me, Dr. Oskin, we can't yes. see the slides advancing. Oh, you don't see it? No, we still see your sort of opening slide. Really? Because I am on the fourth or the fifth slide. Wow, okay. So what I will do is uh, stop share and maybe reshare. Can you see it? Can you see my slides? Uh, not just yet. It, it's uh, starting the screen sharing, I think. Is unexpectedly quit. Maybe what I will do is I will leave and come back. Well, while we're waiting for Dr. Oskan to come back, uh, um, uh, Lynn, are you able to answer this question that we got about Joshua Trees? Oh, well, she's coming back. Let's, let's do it later. So can you hear and see me hopefully, right? Yes, we can. Thank you. So this is where I left, but uh, you missed a couple of slides, uh, I believe, before this. But, uh, in, you know, so we were at the point where we tried to say that we'll mitigate the carbon dioxide emission, uh, which is about between 20 to 30 percent globally, by moving from uh, the oil-based cars to the electrical vehicles. And if you look at the, the data uh, provided to us by Bloomberg, what uh, they say is that uh, we see a rise of the electrical cars towards the future. And uh, more than about 400 million electrical vehicles are expected by uh, 2050, you know, 40. And so what does this mean? Uh, so this means that to run these, you know, high demand electrical vehicles to power them, we need batteries as well. So we need to do more batteries than what we are doing today. Um, by looking at the, the data here, so this is the estimate, it shows that, uh, you know, the similar increase in the number of electrical vehicles and exponential increase to be expected for the future of the demand on the uh, EV batteries. And at the same time, what we are seeing, which is nice, that the, the cost of the, uh, the batteries are going down. So what this shows is that since about the one third of the cost of an electrical vehicle is coming from the battery and battery pack, then you know, if we lower the cost of the batteries, it means that the, the cost of the electrical vehicle will be also falling. And this means more people can afford purchasing electrical vehicles. So, so this is something that our group try to pay attention to see how can we increase the, the performance of the electrical vehicles at the same time, you know, which is the batteries, how we can increase the performance of the batteries at the same time, lowering the cost. And this is the battery cost breakdown. So we, when we look at any battery that is powering the EVs, and there is material costs, overhead costs, capital, equipment, labor, and so on, but the material cost is the highest. And, and the, the, the bottom here, it shows the material breakdown, 
within the components of the, the batteries. Uh, so the cathode battery materials are more expensive and then uh, the, the anode material. So if we can make some impact on these raw materials and find cheaper alternatives that will work and at the same time this gives us the same or better performance. So this was the question that we would like to keep with us and, uh, and then also considering a huge demand that is coming for the batteries to power the electrical vehicles, we start asking more questions like, will raw materials for battery manufacturing remain sustainable? Or can the cost of raw materials uh, and the cost of batteries can be controlled and kept low? And are cobalt, lithium, nickel, and manganese, and these are the metals, the elements that and the graphite also, the raw materials to make the batteries, can they be sustainable? Because you need to uh, basically mine more, you need to frack more, and so on and so forth. Whether this has any environmental negative impacts when we are doing so. So this is where I come in and then try to make some uh, basically changes or improvements, uh, if you like. So this slot, you know, the, what uh, it shows here is that uh, starting all the way back from the industrial revolution till today, we accumulated and uh, the, uh, accumulate all this global plastic production, which is around 8300 million metric tons. And only 9% is being recycled and 79% pretty much or about 80% accumulated in the landfills on the environment. So one question we ask, can we use these plastic waste to make batteries? And while we are making these plastics, what we do also, we keep pumping more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Uh, just last year in 2019, and the amount of plastics that we manufactured actually added about 189 coal plants, which runs around 500 megawatt uh, power uh, of carbon di equivalent carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So what we are doing, we keep adding additional carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, but at the same time, we are wasting and then trashing these plastics uh, on the earth. If we look at the lifetime of these uh, plastics bottles, and they are around like 450 years. So if I drink one water and then put my plastic on the floor, it's gonna be there for a minimum of 450 years. And similarly, beverage bottles like glass bottles, it's undetermined. So the question to our research group was, can we use both plastic and glass waste to make batteries? And these are some snapshots from our lab in UC Riverside uh, in the engineering. And uh, you can see everything is pretty well equipped so we can uh, synthesize materials, we can manufacture batteries, and we can also test them well. And a couple of movies that I will show you. The first one is using these plastic bottles and how we convert them into a high grade battery materials and then start doing batteries out of them. And as you can see, we are just cutting a regular plastic PET water bottle and then we dissolve that. And after dissolution, what we do is we create this fabric made of the microfibers using electrospinning. And this is also a high resolution microscopy image showing, showing the structure. And now we take that and then and start manufacturing the batteries. And once we manufacture, then we put them into the tester to test 
and see their performance. As you can see, the battery is turning on the lights, so it works. And this is the tester, so we can do more additional and detailed testing to see the performance, life cycle, and so on. So it's doable. The second one is using the glass waste. Whether we can take the glass waste out of the trash can or recycle bin, as you can see in the video, and we can convert that into usable, you know, as you can see here, these are the series of the synthesis processes that it goes through until it becomes a, a coin cell battery. And, and then we take this battery, as you can see, it's showing uh, how we build layer by layer and basically clamp it and close it. And this is the tester where we test the batteries. So in addition to the, the plastic bottle and, and also the glass bottle waste uh, use, we also looked into the biomass. And one of the biomass that we used is portobello mushrooms. And we took the portobello mushrooms and then we do synthesis. After the synthesis, what we have shown that we get an equivalent today's graphite uh, performance as an anode material. And at the same time, we had about like 15% cost saving uh, as compared to today's battery. And besides the, the waste glass and plastic bottle, we also end up using sand from the beach. And uh, after doing processing, as you can see, this is the sand uh, that we have used. Uh, that gave us about 30% cost saving uh, overall on the, the current batteries. So regardless, we are on the right track. Uh, by biomass, we received about 15% cost saving and better performance. And uh, with sand battery, about 30% and about three times better performance. And, and also for the plastic and the glass waste is about anywhere 30% to 20% uh, cost savings. The question is, you know, all, everything sounds well and wonderful, but uh, you know, whether this is something to be adaptable by the industry, whether uh, we can scale this up and then use the same manufacturing floor that, you know, a battery manufacturer is doing and using today, and we can scale this up. And that's what we have demonstrated here uh, this is uh, actually, as you can see here, a pouch format. It originally was the coil cell format. This is 15 layers of these uh, materials that stack on the top of each other. Uh, we have shown about 30% reduction in the cost and also about 33% improvement in the performance. This is compared to the batteries that is used today uh, in Tesla vehicles. And uh, another thing that uh, we looked at is also, as I mentioned earlier, the oil spills. And unfortunately today, what we see is uh, if there is any oil spill from an oil tank, and uh, the, almost the only way to clean is burn burning the oil. And so that's what you are seeing in the video, that you are burning the oil on the surface of the ocean. And obviously this will be adding additional carbon dioxide to the atmosphere where we try to eliminate this. So we want to remove the extra carbon dioxide emission and then at the same time clean the oceans. So we come up with this new material that we named as sponge and this material uh, uh, with a model of you know uh, clean as you swim so we made actually uh, a bikini and and swimsuit uh, out of these just to uh, show people and uh, and then the video 
uh, here just uh, showed us that uh, I think it's gonna start from the beginning hopefully yes and then the video here uh, is showing us that this material indeed it is maybe I should stop this so I can play this one Yeah, so what uh, you see here is that, so this is the oil on the left, on the left, and then uh, the, the one on the right is the sponge. So we are going to take that uh, sponge and then try to clean the, the blue oil on the left side. So as the video progresses, you'll see that, you know, it's totally cleaning. And we just use and adapted this material uh, uh, to make a bikini. And again, it's just to uh, take people's attention and saying that, you know, clean uh, is your swim. All right, I think this is the end of my presentation. Sorry that we end up having some issues uh, with the uh, sharing. And uh, I am an amateur cartoonist, and then this is uh, one of the cartoons that I made uh, for using the Avengers, and uh, they are taking responsibility uh, to do some help with the, the plastic uh, challenges that we are facing. So hopefully uh, everybody will be thinking about uh, what personally they can contribute to address some of the challenges moving forward. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Anskan. I'm sorry you had those difficulties and thank you for the talk as, and also for those excellent cartoons. Um, <laughs> But since you are, you know, your talk focus on sustainability, um, a very quick question for you. How can we in inland Southern California and beyond make our planet more sustainable? That's, I think, a question that uh, really everybody should be asking. And uh, the, the, question, the answer that covers everything is save the planet. The save the planet means a lot. So there are levels of doing this, uh, personal level, you know, country level and global level. So as a person, what can I do? So I can tell you the things that you can do. So you can try to lower uh, your carbon emission. And a couple things that you can do yourself, you can drive, you know, green, which is electrical vehicles, if you can, so this is one thing. And then the secondly is, um, uh, you can, uh, if, if you are a meat lover versus, you know, vegetarian, and the, the difference between the two in the carbon emission is about 40%. So imagine that the less meat that you eat, which actually will be helping personally reducing your carbon footprint. Uh, so you can go in between rather than, you know, 40% more, maybe you can come to 30 or the midway. And another thing is uh, maybe you can change your incandescent lamps to light emitting uh, lamps. And uh, the light emitting lamps, they save about 80% of power. So for old lamps, you have to spend 80% more power, which means that this power is coming from the, the coal-based or oil-based, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, electrical production. So that also uh, is a waste. And one another interesting thing that not many people knows uh, is the, the tires. So your tire pressure. So you wanna make sure that you check your tire pressure because the efficiency of driving and then the emission of uh, uh, your fuel is increasing. And if, if your tire pressure is not right. So these are the personal things that you can do uh, in the government level, you know, at the country level, of course, we try to 
maybe mitigate and control the emission by the industry and by the buildings and smart cities and so on that can be discussed further and at the global level you know Paris agreement that as Robert mentioned uh, his presentation is one uh, way to you know address all these challenges that we are facing uh, together uh, at the end we have only one planet so I think everybody needs to uh, contribute and take responsibility thank you thank you for that um, and I think we will move now to questions from the audience so if Dr. Sweet and Alan can join us, that'd be awesome. So let's see, I'm looking at the questions. One question is how will climate change affect our climate growing zones? That is, will vegetation indigenous to, to specific areas persist? Who would like to take that? I'll take it. Yep, so, so our efforts to model Joshua tree habitat are similar to other efforts that are happening as well too. Uh, model, you know, vegetation distribution across, you know, really the planet. And so, I mean, ultimately, we're probably looking at shifting northward, um, excuse me, or poleward um, uh, in the respective hemispheres um, for species. Um, there, they have been seeing some shifts in where eastern, even eastern trees are, are shifting along climate zones. Um, climate affects things like, you know, growing season, frost days, all things that are important for uh, vegetation, for farmers. So yeah, growing zones will be affected. Um, as to how exactly much, um, you know, there are probably other studies that have actually been looking at that, uh, but certainly they'll be affected. Yeah. Okay. And there's another question uh, for you. Uh, what age do most Joshua trees live to? Yeah, I mean, probably most around 150 years. Um, some maybe up to, you know, 300 years. The problem is they don't lay annual growth rings similar to, you know, like an oak tree. Uh, they are a monocot related to, you know, palm trees and grasses. So they actually don't have annual rings. So we actually have to watch them grow. So they grow at about a rate of, you know, one to two inches a year is, is the estimate, but that depends on the precipitation in the particular area. And then an audience member wants to know, wasn't there a recent fire which destroyed Joshua trees? Can you talk about that? Yeah, I showed a photo actually of, of that stand. I went up to the Sema Dome fire in Mojave National Preserve. That is actually a stand of Eastern Joshua trees, which uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service has, uh, has um, emphasized that it's probably a different species. So there's actually an Eastern Joshua tree that's out towards Vegas, and Mojave, Mojave National Preserve. And then we are uh, we have the Western Joshua tree here in Joshua tree and going to the north and into a uh, Death Valley and up to Conglomerate Mesa. Um, so two different species, uh, both vulnerable to fire. More research certainly needs to be done there to really know what's going on. That stand was really devastated. Yeah. All right, thank you. We have a question for Dr. Oskan. How energy intensive is it to create a battery from plastic and other waste? So, uh, energy intensive, uh, depending on the, the process. Uh, so usually when you take uh, uh, plastic waste, so you go through some uh, melting process and then carbonization. And the carbonization process is the thermal process that is uh, basically energy demanding, uh, the most energy demanding uh, part of the process. And uh, we do have uh, some modifications that we made and uh, in this thermal process and we saved uh, almost up to 40 percent uh, of energy savings compared to what others have shown. And this is totally, uh, you know, how you do the terminal process, at what temperature, what type of equipment you use, and how you structure the process itself. So we demonstrated about 40% savings uh, of energy is possible. Okay. And an audience member has a question for you, Dr. Askan. Following through on the life cycle of electric vehicles, what happens to lithium ion batteries when they expire? Can they be recycled? So that's, just, I think, an uh, excellent question. So this is what people keep asking more and more. And uh, the, yeah, there is a life cycle for the batteries. And at this point, uh, actually, 
it's uh, pretty bad if you know the numbers. Uh, if the, the batteries, the capacity goes down to 80%, from 100% to 80%, the Tesla calls you and they take entire uh, battery you know, structure and put a new one because that means that your, your uh, range will go down. And uh, if the, the capacity decays, which happens over time, and, uh, and then they have to give you a new batch of batteries. So what they are doing right now, the ones that are 80% capacity, so they try to use this as a second life battery. And they take these and then use these on the, the wall uh, batteries where uh, locally in your house uh, with the solar combination so they try to uh, put a wall saving uh, battery so there is a second life to those but after that there will be a third life uh, which definitely uh, I think unfortunately right now is going to uh, find itself in the landfill. Got it thank you. Well, the next two questions are for anyone on the panel. Uh, an audience member asks, I've seen models showing the single biggest way for individuals to reduce carbon footprint is to stop at one child or zero. Is this correct? And why is it not mentioned enough? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, yes, that, that uh, that that's true. Um, that that was a, a, a paper published actually in in, in Science uh, a couple of years ago, um, but I don't really think that that's a feasible way of of of, of combating the issue. Um, I mean, obviously, that uh, the the amount of emission emissions that we have is directly proportional to the number of people on the planet. Um, so more people, more emissions, all things equal. Um, obviously, we can become more efficient, and we can switch from a uh, fossil fuel based economy to one based on renewables, um, which will decrease our carbon emissions independent of, of, of population. Um, but that science paper, I think, is a little bit misleading um, because it's basically advocating for, <laughs> for uh, basically population control to combat the problem. So it's not really addressing the root cause of the problem. Okay, great. Thank you. And the second question is, if people do not change their habits and the world's population is expected to grow to 9 billion by 2050, would you predict more world governments to mandate population control measures uh, similar to, say, China? Uh, I'll, I'll comment again. Um, I, I, I don't know, um, but I guess, you know, kind of what I said uh, in response to the earlier question, it, it doesn't seem to me that population control is, is a solution. Um, I mean, ultimately, it's, it's, it's a way around addressing the actual problem. Um, and, you know, I mean, China, China is its, its, its own country, uh, but I think in the United States, if, uh, if, if there was some policy in place, a one child policy, I, I don't think that that's going to fly. Okay. And, and I want to also respond to that. And uh, if you look at the uh, the most greenhouse gas, like a carbon dioxide uh, emission uh, worldwide, so if you see uh, China, Europe, and US, uh, US could have less population but more industrialized. So that's why you know the emission is more, the contribution is more. So as uh, Robert said, you know it's not just the population, but the the way that how we live and how we make regulations to control the emission. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a question for Dr. Allen. Uh, could you please explain terrain following downscaling models so that air quality becomes pertinent to local topography and regional climates? Um, that was a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> uh, terrain following, uh, can, you, can you repeat that one, one more time? Uh, terrain following downscaling models so that air quality becomes pertinent to local topography and regional climates. Okay, so I think the question, if I could maybe rephrase the question a little more generally, I, I, I think what the, what the individual is asking is, um, 
you know, the, the, the models that I use are, are relatively coarse resolution. So I discussed how um, the, the average grid box size for, for today's models is about uh, 50 to 100 kilometers. Um, so that makes it difficult to simulate um, uh, local phenomena such as uh, air quality um, at small scales. Um, but there are ways around that. So I, I focus on, on the global climate models, um, but there are uh, regional climate models as well as air quality models that are used to simulate uh, smaller regions of the planet at much higher resolution. So these models exist um, and they provide air quality forecasts. Um, they also provide um, regional uh, climate change projections um, but uh, that, that's, that, that's not something that I directly work on, but that's an, another um, active area of, of, of climate research. And Dr. Allen, there's one more for you, and this might be our final question. Um, how much does weather, like fog, for example, how much does that change the temperature on the ground, especially for coastal California, and do you account for that in your models? Um, yeah, so uh, fog um, is, is basically a cloud that uh, exists uh, near the surface um, and uh, it, 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 it's going to have a strong cooling effect. I mean, this is, this is clear for anyone that lives um, in Southern California or, or along the coast. Um, there's a very strong um, temperature gradient as you head inland, right? So you say as you go from uh, downtown Los Angeles to Riverside. Um, there's a very strong temperature gradient. Uh, part of that is due to the ocean, um, but uh, the marine stratocumulus clouds that we get, as well as the, the fog, um, is, is another contribution. Um, so fog and, and these marine stratocumulus clouds are important, um, but they're, they're basically most important for um, um, governing the diurnal temperature range. All right, so these fog layers that we get tend to occur in the morning, um, and then as the sun comes out and gets more intense during the day, those fog layers tend to burn off. Um, but that results in um, a, basically a, a depressed um, maximum temperature for that day. So the models um, that I use um, probably do not account for fog. Um, they do account for these marine stratocumulus clouds, which are incredibly important for the climate system. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, there's actually one more question. Are there any carbon dioxide scrubbing technologies that look promising for the atmosphere? I think I can maybe uh, say a couple things. Uh, some says like uh, types of uh, plants, they absorb more carbon dioxide than the others. So they try to do plantation uh, areas to absorb more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and also from the ocean at the same time because uh, when there are more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and uh, about uh, almost half or one third is being absorbed by the, the oceans too. So you need to remove the carbon dioxide from the ocean and also from the air. And uh, there are some companies that are coming up, they literally uh, try to suck the air out of the atmosphere and they run this through their system and try to condensate the carbon dioxide and then give the air back to the atmosphere. So there are some technologies that people are using uh, which uh, probably they are not at the level of efficiency we like to have but uh, there is some activities uh, there, but it's not sufficient. So definitely this is something that I think moving forward, not just in US, but like worldwide, because this is a worldwide problem uh, that everybody needs to look into. Thank you. And thank you all of you for this extraordinary um, panel discussion. We've learned so much from it. Uh, we have some other questions coming in, but unfortunately we have run out of time but we will try to have questions from the audience answered and sent to them on request. And uh, thank you again, this was fabulous, I learned a lot. And I'm gonna turn this over to Alison. 
Yes, yes, thank you. I would um, really like to thank Professor Allen and Dr. Sweet and Professor Ozkin for sharing their climate change research with us uh, today. And of course, Iqbal Pitawala for moderating this presentation. I'd also like to thank my colleagues on the Stewardship Committee, many of whom I see attended, and the Office of Development staff uh, who helped us plan today's panel. So um, with all of that, I will wish you a lovely evening. This concludes our, our presentation and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.